Okay, so here we are with part two of Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence. And here we go. Uh, starting at paragraph 22. The three sisters checked to make sure they hadn't missed anything then. When they were absolutely satisfied, Molly grabbed the galvanized bucket and ordered Gracie to get a hold of the other side and walk quickly, trying not to spill the contents as they made their way to the lavatories. Daisy waited under the large pine tree near the stables. She reached up and broke a small twig that was hanging down low and was examining it closely when the other two joined her. Look, Dugudu, like grass Indy, which is, uh, isn't it? That's just translation there. Ask Daisy, passing the twig to Molly to feel. You I, which means yes, she said as she gave it to Gracie, who crushed the, pine ne the green pine needles into her small hands and sniffed them. She liked the smell and was about to give her opinion when Molly reminded them that they didn't have time to stand around examining pine needles. Come on, run, you two, she said sharply as she started to run towards the river. Many young people had stood under the same big pine tree and waited while someone went to the stable or the garage to distract Maitland, the caretaker and stableman. Then they would give the signal that the coast was clear and everyone would dash into the granary and fill their empty fruit tins with wheat from one of the opened bags at the back of the shed. Some of it was roasted on flat tins over the hot coals. The rest was saved to fill initials that had been dug into the sloping embankment or firm yellow sand al along the cliffs. These were left until the first rain came. Then all the inmates would rush down to inspect the cliffs. This grass graffiti revealed the new summer romances between the older boys and girls. But these three girls from East Pilbara had no intention of participating. They had a more important task ahead of them. On they went, dashing down the sandy slope of the cliffs, dodging the small shrubs on the way, and following the narrow path to the flooded river. They slowed down only when they reached the bottom. Molly paused briefly, glancing at the pumping shed on the right, on their right, where they had been the day before. Turn, turning towards it, she said to Gracie and Daisy, this way. She ran for about 25 meters, crashing into the thick paper bark trees and the branches of the river gums that blocked their path. Molly strode on as best she could along the muddy banks, pausing only to urge her young sisters to hurry up and try to keep up with her. She kept up that pace until she saw what she thought to be a likely spot to cross the swift flowing river. The three girls watched swirling currents and the white and brown frothy foam that clung to the trunks of the young river gums and clumps of tea trees. They didn't know that this became one of the most popular spots during the hot summer days. This was the local swimming pool that would be filled with naked or semi-naked brown bodies, laughing, splashing, swimming, and diving into the cool brown water during the long summer afternoons. Every now and then, the swimmers would sit on a, the coarse river sand and yank up, yank ugly brown slimy leeches off their bodies and impale them on sticks and turn them inside out and plunge them into the hot burning mud. The next day, the swimmers would pull the sticks out of the sand and gloat at the shriveled dry skins that were once horrible little creatures ready to suck all the blood from their bodies, or so the young people were led to believe. The river is too deep and fast here. Let's try up further, Molly said, leaving the way through the thick young suckers and washed up logs. They continued along the bank, making slow progress through the obstacles that nature had left in their path. At last, they came to a section in the river that seemed narrow enough to cross. We'll try here, said Molly, as she bent down to pick up a long stick. She slid down the bank into the river and began measuring its depth, just as she had seen Edna Green do the previous afternoon, while Daisy and Gracie watched patiently on the bank. Not too deep, Molly said. Not here. Gulu, wait, doo, doo cried the youngsters as they ran to follow her through the wet foliage. The three girls walked along the muddy banks. Oh, I'm sorry. For another 25 meters, when they came to a clearing devoid of any shrubs, or young suckers, where the floods had receded. In a couple weeks' time, this place would become a muddy skating rink where the girls of the settlement would spend hours having fun skating up and down the slippery mud. The idea was to skate by placing one foot in front of the other and maintain your balance for a couple of meters at least. The boys had their own sk skating area further up ahead. And it looks like I will have to do part three to finish this story, so tune in for part three of the story here. Thanks, guys. Have a great one.